Nestled in a land of extremes, the Eastern Sierra, home of the Inyo National Forest, contains a stunning mosaic of life. From the dry desert peaks of the White Nino mountain ranges to the snow-capped grandeur of the Sierra Nevada, we are surrounded by natural wonders. The Paiute and Shoshone peoples were the first human inhabitants of this land and call the Owens Valley Paiahunaru, meaning land of the flowing water. Home to Mount Whitney, the highest peak in the continental U.S., the White Mountains, the largest and highest desert range, Mono Lake, the second oldest lake in North America, one of the world's oldest trees and a vast array of unique species. The Inyo National Forest is full of life and a place where many come to enjoy everything it has to offer. But despite its appearances, it too feels the pressure of climate change. The warming climate has begun to reshape the landscape and its carefully adapted species. If we look closely, we can see this change all around us a reminder that we too are tethered to a fragile web of life. And so, we're met with a challenging question. How will we adapt? The Sierra Nevada mountains create a unique climate on their eastern slopes. The range creates an effect called a rain shadow, where high elevations and cold temperatures induce rainfall before the water can reach further east, creating the vast Great Basin Desert on the eastern side of the Sierra. Mountain snowmelt holds an ample reserve of fresh water that is vital to life in the state of California. As winter thaws into spring, snowmelt replenishes creeks and streams that revive the landscape in preparation for summer as well as provides water for 3.8 million people all the way to Los Angeles. But altered precipitation patterns are beginning to cause drastic changes. What we have seen is increase in variability in those precipitation patterns. So when we have droughts, they can become more exceptional droughts, and those droughts can be more prolonged. And then we can have a year where it's dramatically high levels of precipitation and snowpack. So it becomes very much feast and famine all of a sudden here on the Enyo when we're dealing with climate change. Longer, hotter, and drier seasons increase the frequency of devastating wildfires, a once healthy force that now burn at more dangerous intensities. We've always had high severity fires. That's a, a necessary function. It makes openings for the next generation of trees. But what we're seeing uh, this day and age is high severity burns at a scale that is unprecedented. When I started out in 1982, at that time, the, much of the Forest Service was a, a temporary workforce, summer job. That certainly, as more and more fires occurred and fire seasons became longer and longer, more than just the summer months, the agencies started to hire more permanent staff. Indigenous peoples were first to use fire as a tool to enhance the landscape for agriculture while supporting the natural fire cycle. For centuries, this enabled them to mitigate excessive overgrowth that would otherwise kindle large-scale fires. But when the Forest Service was established in 1905, one of its main missions was to suppress all fires under the Forest Fires Emergency Act, which ultimately led to less healthy forests more prone to burning. Fuel loads across the Sierra Nevada and the West uh, are incredibly high due to inadvertent mismanagement strategy by the Forest Service that was well intended, but really missed the mark, and we waged a war on fire. And it's come back to haunt us, and it has to change. With today's record-breaking high temperatures, plus years of excessive fuel buildup, and increasing instances of human-caused fires, wildfires are a far greater threat than ever before. The subsequent lack of moisture in nutritional soil has conjured an abnormally dry landscape dominated by drought-resistant shrubs and encroached on by disease and insects. Climate change is pervasive here on the International Forest. You can pretty much look at any of the ecosystems from the lower to the higher elevation here in the White Park Pine Forest 
and find some effect of climate change on those ecosystems. I'd say the biggest impacts of that warming is how they're impacting trees and some of the insects that are impacting those trees. In fact, most of our tree species here, you'll find that there are there's some sort of native beetle that's associated with them that could potentially cause mortality to those trees. You can do that oftentimes by attacking the tree in large numbers, overwhelming the defenses of the trees, and killing them. Many conifer species are subject to the effects of climate change. Moisture stress from rising temperatures may be causing stands such as pinyon pines to retreat further upslope with higher and higher rates of mortality. To some species, it will mark a mere sliver of their lifespan. The Great Basin Bristlecone Pine is one of the oldest living tree species on Earth. Adapted to harsh, dry conditions, these ancient souls may well be capable of surviving changing temperatures, but will they be left untouched? Only time will tell. Wildlife, too, must adapt to new environmental stress, as the changing climate forces their geographical range to shift. So in the golden trout wilderness, we have these beautiful native trout that exist nowhere else other than in this watershed here. As uh, we're seeing the heating trend and decreased precipitation trend, conditions out here are getting increasingly difficult. So in these really prolonged droughts and excessively dry years, we see a lot of shrinkage of the overall habitat that they have here and that the habitat that does still have water may become excessively warm for them. We are no exception to the pressures posed by climate change. We depend on this land for food, water, shelter, and an escape from modern routine. With nearly four million visitors per year, the Inyo National Forest is one of the most visited national forests in California, where so many come to enjoy the natural landscape. Climate change presents us with many challenges, as well as many opportunities for growth. In the face of imminent change, we can choose to adapt, forging partnerships that accommodate change rather than just mitigating it. Launched in collaboration with the White Bark Institute, the Eastern Sierra Climate and Community Resilience Project is a crucial step towards a healthier Inyo National Forest. Its aim is to return forest densities back to more historic ranges so that we prepare the landscape for the reintroduction of beneficial fire. Prescribed burns are an effective way to decrease the fuel load and help mitigate the possibility of larger scale wildfires. And many organizations are turning to this age old practice instead of merely fire suppression. I know that in Northern California, I've seen tribal members who are in the Forest Service who are also doing fire, doing prescribed fire for their people, burning out plants and things like that to regrow new berries and new things. I think a resounding message that's critical for folks to understand that um, live and recreate in California is there is no fire-free future in this state or in the Western states. So our options are we adapt, or we decide to leave. We have to change our relationship with fire. That's, that's pretty critical. Likewise, Trout Unlimited launched the Kern Meadows Restoration Project to restore meadow ecosystems that have been degraded through a combination of human use and climate change. Healthy meadows are a crucial part of fire resiliency and serve as a refuge for plants and animals during fire and drought. Their functionality has decreased from overheating and less precipitation. When a meadow is fully functional and healthy and wet, it acts as a carbon sink and can retain tons and tons of carbon. When they're damaged and degraded, it can actually lose carbon. So it really benefits us to make sure that these systems are doing their best to retain the carbon and, and hold it within them. The Kern Meadows Restoration Project that we're embarking on right now, we've got currently 15 meadows in the program. A lot of them are in wilderness and we're seeking to bring up the water table, retain water in the headwaters, increase wetness in the meadows, and support all of the beautiful biodiversity, plant life, and animal life that exists here.
Both of these projects, along with most sustainable initiatives, are fueled by skill and creativity. And yet, their goals are unattainable without community support and a growth mindset. The Paiute people, the indigenous people of this area, have to trust the Inyo National Forest with the knowledge that they have and with the sharing of that knowledge and to hope that that knowledge isn't used against them, to exclude them from those areas. Most importantly, our success requires a fundamental shift in perspective, one where we recognize ourselves as part of nature, not separate from it. The timing right now for action is of critical importance. We have a pretty narrow window of the next decade or two to intercept this trajectory of wildfires resetting forests back to ground zero. So if we want to have any say in forests sticking around and the type of forest that we get to live with, now is the time to act. It's not just a mechanical thing, it's a spiritual thing. And that's something that I'm, I'm really working on with another tribal elder to try to get my head around that and to try to put together that both native philosophy and what is science telling us. We are all woven into an intricate web, each of our lives subtly entwined. We all must adapt to survive. And it is each of our duties to those big and small, ancient and budding, to sustain the vital ecosystem of the Eastern Sierra.